So, at the end of our last lecture, uh, we were talking about spontaneity and enthalpy, and how enthalpy is not the whole story. Uh, some uh, exothermic, most, well, some exothermic processes are spontaneous, some exothermic processes are not. Uh, some endothermic processes are spontaneous, some endothermic processes are not spontaneous. Okay. So, let, let's take a look at some other, uh, they're, they're classic, classic examples, they're favorite examples, they're, they're great ways of explaining this sort of stuff. Um, some classic examples of spontaneity. Okay. Uh, first, let's um, talk about some uh, basic vocab. Um, uh, open, closed, and isolated systems. Uh, an open system, uh, it would be something like uh, the planet Earth. Uh, matter and energy are free to move into and out of the system. Okay? There, there's nothing stopping uh, anything from going in or out of the system. Um, matter rains down on the Earth all the time. Um, shooting stars are just actually you know, tiny particles of dust falling into the atmosphere from space. Um, and energy uh, comes in, uh, you know, the sunlight, for example. But energy also goes out. Uh, the Earth is constantly radiating heat out into space. Good thing, too, or we'd be cooked. Um, matter can also leave, like when we went to the moon. Uh, for the most part, though, we're, we're not like leaking gas or dust into space. Not anymore, anyway. So that's an open system. A closed system, um, energy can move in or out, but matter cannot. So, like a glass bottle, okay? uh, light can go in or out, okay? uh, heat can go in or out of that, of that glass bottle. Uh, so that is a closed system because you know it's a closed bottle. You know, matter can't go through the glass, but energy can. Okay? Uh, and finally, we have an isolated system. Uh, an isolated system is one where neither matter nor energy can move in or out, okay? It, it's completely sealed off from the rest of the universe. Uh, isolated systems can't really exist, um, but, but they're good for pretending. Uh, they're, they're very useful for uh, considering, you know, sort of ideal cases, so we can sort of get a good feel for how things are supposed to happen, you know, on, uh, on the bench top. You know, just making things simple. Because in an isolated system, you can have a universe where only two things exist. Um, whereas in the real universe, more than two things exist. <laughs> um, so, that, so those are just uh, some bits of vocab. Now, imagine you have an isolated system with two chambers. Uh, one that is completely empty, it's a vacuum, and the other one is full of gas. Okay? Um, when you open up, say, a spigot uh, so that gas can flow between the two chambers, then the gas in the filled chamber will expand into the empty chamber. Uh, that, that's a spontaneous process. Uh, there's, there's nothing that can you know, sort of prevent that, except you know, literally sealing it off, you know, closing the systems off from one another. Right? Um, I mean, this, this is obvious, uh, hopefully. You know, it's air escaping from a balloon or something like that. Um, I, I just uh, the gas will expand. Um, we're talking about an isolated system, though, okay? so energy is not getting in or out. The total energy is uh, uh, going to be the same you know, before the gas expands, after the gas expands. Okay? Delta U, the internal energy, okay? it's just delta H, it's equal to Q, it's equal to zero. There's, there's no, um, no energy getting in or out. Right? So it's neither an exothermic nor an endothermic process, okay? and yet it's spontaneous. Uh, similarly, you know, an isolated system, you know, you have two bricks, one is hot, one is cold, they're touching one another. Um, the temperatures will change. Heat will flow from the hot brick to the cold brick until the two bricks are at the same temperature. Okay. Once again, this is spontaneous and hopefully completely unsurprising. And again, we're talking about an isolated system. And delta U is equal to delta H is equal to Q is equal to zero. Okay, there's there's no change in internal energy for these uh, two isolated systems we're talking about. Okay. So, 
there's no change in enthalpy. Okay? These, these processes are neither endothermic nor exothermic, and yet they're spontaneous. So what, uh, what else is there? What else are we talking about? Well, I'm not going to keep you in suspense. It's entropy. Okay? Uh, entropy is something that's usually very poorly explained by TV and movies, but uh, it's a state function. Remember, a state function, all that matters is the end point and the starting point. It's, it's path independent. Okay? So just enthalpy is a state function. Um, the, 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 uh, the distance between two points in space is a state function. Okay? Whereas um, the distance you travel to get from one place to another is not a state function. That does depend on the path you take. Um, so like I said, if there was... Uh, it was first developed out of an understanding of uh, the steam engines and the formalism of the reversible process. Um, a reversible process is another one of those things that doesn't really exist. Uh, you have to do something infinitely slowly in order for it to be reversible. Um, but the reason they talk about reversible processes is because uh, the entropy change, uh, regardless of how the process is carried out, the entropy change for the process will be the same as if it were carried out reversibly. And reversible, reversibility, reversibilism, uh, that, uh, that makes it easier to do some calculations if you're taking physical chemistry. But you're not, so we're gonna skip over a whole lot of that. Um, but what you get out of that uh, is the definition on the right. Uh, delta S is equal to Q reversible over T. So the heat change for if the process is carried out reversibly divided by the temperature uh, at every point along that path. So that, that's kind of the weird thing about uh, entropy change is that um, it ends up being path independent. Um, but the easiest way to calculate it, it depends on the path. <laughs> but uh, don't worry about that. It's a, it's a useful definition. It's a powerful definition uh, once you uh, have... Uh, some, uh, a lot more math under your belts, but we are not going to make use of it because you guys don't have that math. So we are going to use a different definition or a different understanding of entropy. And uh, the next definition, which will help us with our understanding of entropy, um, it comes from the work of Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, a German. Um, he thought about things in terms of microstates. You know, instead of looking at an entire you know, steam engine, he thought about individual particles. Okay. Um, and he came up with a, a different understanding of entropy. Uh, this one over at the right, it says S equals... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it should look like this. Uh, uh, um, S equals uh, K sub B, that's Boltzmann's constant, um, times log of W, okay. uh, where... Boltzmann constant is um, a conversion factor, and W is uh, the number of different ways of arranging a system, okay, the number of microstates available. So this, this is more useful. Okay. So um, let's consider really quickly, hopefully really quickly, uh, um, a, a, a very, very small system. So here we have the simple system. Okay, it's just... 10 spots, 10 seats, 10 chairs, say, in an otherwise empty universe, where you can put things, you know, 10 boxes, okay? Um, if we have uh, zero particles, okay, to put in those boxes, how many different ways can we put zero particles into 10 boxes? Okay, what is W equal to? Well, it's, it's just equal to zero, okay? There's only one way that you could have 10 empty boxes. The boxes can't be moved, right? Okay, they're just all empty. Okay, so W is equal to 1. So when you look at entropy, S is equal to K log of W. Don't worry about what K is equal to right now. Um, so uh, uh, it's equal to K log of 1. Okay, W is equal to 1. And log of 1 is just 0. E to the 0 is 1. Okay. Um, so S, entropy, is equal to 0. Okay, and... Okay, so that, there's, there's a good starting point. If there's nothing present, there's no entropy. Entropy is just equal to zero. Um, and, and go ahead and notice uh, that Boltzmann's uh, uh, formula, it's not a delta S, it's just S. Okay? So it's, you know, uh, 
entropy is you know one of those things where you can it's conceivably possible you could actually measure the absolute entropy of a particular system um, instead of just measuring the change in something from one place to another. All right. Uh, so, so uh, for uh, an empty system, entropy is equal to zero. And what if you have one particle? Well, you could put that particle in the first box, or you could put it into the fourth box, or you could put it into the ninth box. So, hopefully it's obvious, there are ten different ways you could arrange this system. W equals ten. Okay. So the entropy of that system is just going to be k log of w, or k times the log, the natural log of ten, is equal to 2.30 times k. Uh, k is a very, very small number, so I hope you'll forgive me if I leave it out for the moment. Um, but for a system with one particle, the entropy of that system is 2.30 times Okay. Uh, now, what if you have two particles? You'd put the particles in boxes one and two, or one and five, three and seven. I mean, it, this is where we start getting into combinatorial mathematics and things like that. I'll, I'll try and just brush right past that and just let you know that W is equal to 45. You know, 10 times 9 divided by 2, uh, because the particles are identical. And that means that S is equal to K log of 45. Uh, so S is equal to 3.81 K. Okay. So entropy has increased once again um, because there are 45 ways of arranging the system instead of merely 10, instead of merely 0. Okay. So we add particles. We're increasing the entropy of the system. Now, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't show you the calculations for each and every one of these. But I went ahead and worked it out for um, all the particles from 0 up to 10. You know, 10 boxes, you can hold up to 10 particles, one in each box. Okay? And then I've got the number of different uh, uh, ways you can arrange those particles in those 10 boxes, and then the entropy based on that. And this is what you see. Um, entropy starts out low, you know, one possibility, you know, uh, so entropy of 0. Then you go up to 10, uh, uh, W equals 10, then 45, 120, 210, 252. And that's where you get a, uh, a, an, uh, an oddity. Okay? Um, at five particles, you have the maximum number of ways of arranging the system. And then it starts going back down. You know, 210, 120, 45, 10, and 1. Okay? So entropy reaches a maximum there. Why is that? Well. Uh, let's go ahead and just look at, uh, you know, uh, what happens when you have nine particles, okay? You see you have bo particles in boxes one through nine, and then you have an empty one. So this is exactly the same as what you saw, you know, back when we started, when we had one particle. Only instead of how many different ways are there of arranging one particle in, uh, uh, in nine empty boxes, now it's one empty box and nine particles with box or nine boxes with particles in them. You know, it's exactly the same. Um, so what entropy really is, is a measure of the freedom of the system, the number of different ways you can arrange the system. Okay? When the system is completely empty, there's only one way to arrange that system. Okay? You have no freedom whatsoever. When the system is completely full, okay, you only have one way to arrange that system. There's no freedom whatsoever. And as you increase the number of particles, you know, at first you're increasing the freedom because there are more and more ways of arranging those different uh, 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 arrangements, you know, the different numbers of particles. But as the system gets more crowded, then increasing the number of particles doesn't increase the entropy. Okay? The, 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 the particles start taking up uh, more and more space and there's less ways to arrange them. So that's what entropy really is. It, it's, it's a measure of the possibility, the number of possible ways of arranging a system. It's the measure of the freedom of the system. And we will go into more detail on that when we return in Lecture 3.